Today on the Matt Walsh Show, I am being canceled for criticizing the LGBT indoctrination of children. I'll address that today. Also, five headlines, including Marjorie Taylor Greene is being called a bigot and a transphobe for defending biological science. West Virginia moves to ban critical race theory, and the cruise industry starts to institute vaccine requirements for passengers. Is that a sign of things to come? In our daily cancellation, we'll talk about Canada's recent anti-bullying campaign, which promises to be about as effective as every other anti-bullying campaign, which is not at all. All of that and more today on The Matt Wall Show. Last night, after our backstage episode wrapped, which, by the way, you should go to, to dailywire.com or YouTube after you're done with this show to watch it, uh, but only after you're done with this show, I logged on to Twitter to discover that I was trending nationwide. One thing I've learned over the years is that when I trend, it's never because everyone is happy about something I said. I've, I've never trended because everyone is saying, wow, I agree with this point that Matt Walsh made. I'm not sure if anyone trends for that reason, but I certainly don't. For me, it's always because people are very mad, very upset, very outraged about some opinion or some other opinion that I expressed. And that was certainly the case here. In this situation, people uh, on the internet were, were, were quite apoplectic about a tweet that I sent out in reaction to a new Gallup poll, which showed that the number of kids and young adults who identify as LGBT has risen in an extraordinary and sudden way over the last few years. This is what I wrote. I said, the number of kids who identify as LGBT, especially trans and bisexual, has absolutely skyrocketed. If you think this is a natural or organic development, you're deluded. The media, Hollywood, and the school system actively recruit children into the LGBT ranks. I followed that up with this. I said, the number of supposedly trans children and young adults is 10 times higher than the number among older generations. Do you think that's because a lot more people are born in the wrong body these days? Whatever the hell that means. No, this is social engineering. In our culture, the LGBT lobby poses the greatest threat to our children, especially the T part. So there it is. The opinion that I have been, uh, that's the opinion that I've been reliably informed by thousands of people is detestable, outrageous, hateful, bigoted, and so on. And much of the reaction was exceedingly unhinged, but none more so than the response from Parker Malloy over at Media Matters, who sent out a frantic string of tweets implying that I'm a pedophile for these opinions. On what basis were these accusations made? Well, no basis, of course. It's just that Parker Malloy disagrees with me, thus feels entitled to make up literally any lie at all in retribution. Those tweets have all now been deleted, by the way. This is what we're dealing with from the opposition. People scummy enough to defame and slander their ideological opponents, but too cowardly to stand by the defamation. Most of the rest of the tweets and messages I've received have been more along the lines of, you know, calling me a piece of garbage, an idiot, a worthless sack of such and such. I should kill myself, et cetera, and so forth. So, first of all, after receiving all of this feedback and seeing that my words were so deeply hurtful to so many people, I want to say with all sincerity that I am not sorry at all, not even a little bit. I couldn't be less sorry for what I said. I'm 100% right. Everything I said was absolutely and totally correct, and I'm so happy that I said it. I am not and could never be sorry for being right. I will, I will however, happily accept the apologies of any of my critics, should they decide to offer them. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears for that. I am a gracious and forgiving man in that way. But as for being sorry myself, not a chance. Not ever. Not ever. I am, though, happy to explain why I'm right about what I said. This is an important issue. By far, one of the most important issues that our culture faces in the present moment. It's worth talking about in greater detail. So, first, let's go back and look at the numbers, okay? According to Gallup, the overall number of Americans who identify as LGBT is up to 5.6%. That's a 1% increase from the last tally in 2017. That's a significant jump in just three or four years. But the truly seismic shifts can be seen among the youngest generations. Among Gen Z, and Gallup defines that as those born between 1997 and 2002, so this doesn't even take into account the very youngest generations, where we can assume the figures are even more dramatic. But among Gen Z, a full 16%, 15.9 to be exact, identify as LGBT. Another 5% have apparently no opinion about their own sexual orientation. Breaking down the numbers further, 2.1% of Gen Zers say they're gay, 1.4% say lesbian. Both of these figures represent at least a doubling over Gen X and older generations. 
And then another another 11.5% say they're bisexual. The number of trans people in Gen Z is almost 2%, 1.8% right now. Now, that might seem like a small portion, but keep in mind that 1.8% is nearly 10 times higher, as I said in the tweet, nearly 10 times higher than the portion among Gen X and older generations. And keep in mind again, also, that this does not take into account those who are born after 2002. And it's the after 2002 generation, those who were born while I was in high school, who've really been hit the hardest by LGBT indoctrination. Yes, LGBT indoctrination. That is what's happening here, and I cannot take seriously anyone who would deny it. The drag queen story hours, the trans books for kids, the gender theory propaganda shoved into kids' minds at the youngest ages, the constant promotion of LGBT lifestyles and identities by school, Hollywood, the media, and so on. All of this has two clear and purposeful effects. Number one, it makes it seem trendy and cool to be LGBT. We've we've gone way beyond mere acceptance or toleration. We have long since gone way beyond those things. It is now, for many young people, seen as more interesting, more fashionable to be able to tack a few letters from the sacred initialism onto your name. Years of associating being cisgender and white with being privileged And being privileged with being an oppressor and a bully has an impact, it turns out. It's supposed to have an impact. It is designed to have the very impact that it's having. But if you point out that the strategies are working, you'll be called a bigot for noticing that there's a strategy at all. So that's the first thing. The second is that kids are being taught to view sex, gender, and sexual orientation a certain way. They're being indoctrinated into a view of sex and orientation that, when adopted by large numbers of people, will automatically and by design increase the LGBT ranks. For example, kids are being taught now that if you're a boy with feminine tendencies, then you might actually be a girl. If you're a girl with masculine tendencies, you might actually be a boy. Kids are taught that this is a a possibility and encouraged to explore that possibility. Back when kids were not being taught this kind of anti-scientific nonsense, a girl with masculine tendencies was just a girl with masculine tendencies. A tomboy, we might have called her. Some girls were that way, and that was fine. Some boys were more feminine, and that was fine, too. Now, we're ushering those types of girls and boys under the trans umbrella. What we're effectively saying is, you can't be that kind of girl or boy anymore. Those don't exist anymore because if you're a feminine boy, then you're a girl. If you're a masculine girl, then you're a boy. Why do you think there are now more young people who call themselves trans than call themselves lesbian? And there are almost as many, and soon will be more, young people calling themselves trans than gay. Why is that? Because we've given young people this new framework for understanding themselves. The problem is that the framework is totally false, incoherent, and based in pseudoscience. So yes, in effect, these children are being recruited to be trans. They are being turned trans. Yes, that is what is happening. Kids are being turned trans. They are being made into something they are not. This is deliberate. It is diabolical. It is damaging and destroying many children. And I will not ever stop calling it what it is, no matter how loud the mob screams or what labels they throw at me. None of that matters to me. What matters is the truth, and this is it. Now let's get to our five headlines. Speaking of which, we'll start here. Number one, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene tried to... um, tried to block the radical so-called Equality Act, which is a horrifically bad law that we'll discuss at greater length tomorrow. But suffice to say for now that uh, if you haven't read much about this law, um, which uh, Dems are going to vote on this week and they'll pass, you know, uh, this this is the consequence of the Democrats having uh, both houses of Congress and and, um, both chambers of Congress and the presidency. You know, they can pass laws like this. And the Equality Act, will have the effect of basically erasing women, legally speaking. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is one of uh, of the Republicans who has tried to block this, has opposed it. Now, the Democrats don't like this. 
So Democratic Congresswoman Marie Newman responded to this um, to this move by by Green by placing a trans flag outside of Marjorie Taylor Greene's office. And she took a, a video, which you can see here. She was very proud. And she took a video of herself placing the trans flag outside of the office. Now, my question is, um, you see there, she's putting it in a flag holder right outside of MTG's office. What, what flag was in that holder before? That's what I want to know. That's my first question. I mean, it's possible they installed a new flag holder, but I, I, I actually doubt they did. My guess is that flag holder was already there. So what flag was occupying that holder before they put the trans flag there? What flag was taken down so that they could put a trans flag in? I'd really like to know the answer to that question. I mean, I have some guesses. Did they take down, did, did this woman take down an American flag to put a trans flag in his place? I don't know. Interesting question, though. Now, um, so that's what that that's that was her response. That was the the high school level response. Where now we and, and and by the way, even if they didn't take down, I mean maybe it was a it was an empty flag holder or something. Even if they didn't take down um, the American flag, uh, it, it is still a disgrace uh, and, in my opinion, a desecration of the American flag that you would put the trans flag there in this hallway with a bunch of American flags, flags that have real meaning and mean something, you put a trans flag there. You know, sending the symbolic message that this flag is, is, is equal to as meaningful as an American flag. It's not. The trans flag doesn't mean anything. What does it mean to have a flag for your orientation or your so-called gender identity? What, 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 what do you need the flag for? What, what is that exactly? The whole idea of, of your, your identity or your orientation having its own flag is absurd. But regardless, there was um, Representative Newman doing that. Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene responds with her own video. Uh, and in, in her video, she, she places a sign that says, there are two genders, male and female, trust the science outside of Newman's door. And she also takes a video of her, of her putting herself up putting that, that sign up there, which I think is great. And now, of course, so we have the, okay, here's the video here. Yep, the sign says there are two genders, male and female. Does it say follow the signs or trust the signs? Trust the signs, I think. And so she puts that, she puts that sign up there. Now, you could call this whole thing, it's, it's exceedingly childish on both ends, you could say, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's the case. I think it's childish on the part of Newman that she started this whole thing, but this is a response in kind. And by the way, it seems like Representative Newman and all the other Democrats, th this is a reminder that they need. Like there, there should be more of those signs saying there, there are two um, genders. Actually, there are two sexes, you know, because gender is, is we won't get into this. I don't want to, I don't want to split hairs, but um, gender is a made up concept as it pertains to human beings. Words, gender is a grammatical concept. Words have gender. Human beings have sex, have, have a sex. You're a male or a female. We don't need both of those. And as we've talked about before, uh, this idea that human beings have a gender and a sex was invented out of whole cloth by a, a, a few crackpots in the mid 20th century. Principal among them would be John Money, who, as you know from listening to this show, John Money invented left-wing gender theory back in the 1950s and 60s. Um, he, was a, he was a quack. He was a pedophile apologist, an actual pedophile apologist, as in he defended some forms of pedophilia. And, um, and uh, he, he tested his gender theories on two young boys who later went on to kill themselves. So uh, th th this was a theory that he invented out of whole cloth, and he tried one experiment to test its legitimacy, and it failed so miserably that it ended with the deaths of two people. So... Anyway, that's why we, we should say sex, not gender. But regardless, she puts that, uh, that, that sign up. That's a sign that Democrats need to see. That's a reminder that they need. But what's happened, of course, is that all of the backlash is to Marjorie Taylor Greene and not Newman. Calling her a transphobe and a bigot and all these things. Simply for, for affirming the reality of biological sex. 
And this isn't going to shock you, probably isn't going to shock you, at least it shouldn't. A lot of Republicans, or at least a, a few that I've seen and probably more to come, have come out against Marjorie Taylor Greene for doing this. Some Republicans in Congress have accused her of, of bigotry for putting that sign up. If you want to know why the Republican Party is utterly irrelevant and just lost everything in the last election, that's why. Not because of Marjorie Taylor Greene, but because of the Republicans that would condemn her for simply asserting the truth of biological science. Okay, number two, this is from the Daily Wire. It says, West Virginia is the latest state seeking to ban so-called critical race theory from the state's workplaces, schools, and government agencies. House Bill 2595 would prohibit discriminatory divisive acts in the workplace, end the teaching of divisive acts in West Virginia schools, and ban the state funding to agencies who promote divisive acts, uh, the legislation outlines. Um, divisive concepts are defined to include the concept that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex, that the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist, that an individual by virtue of his or her sex, race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously, um, that an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex, that members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to, uh, to race or sex, that an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. So these are all, con th th this is how we, they are defining divisive concepts that they're looking to outlaw in the workplace. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and they, they, they go into greater, to more detailed definitions as well. I, I think this is great. I mean, this, this is what state houses need to do, need to pass laws like this. There need to be laws passed. This is what conservatives should be pushing for. Not merely complaining about it, but doing something. And one thing that we can do, especially if you control a state house, pass a law against it. That needs to happen. Also, lawsuits. If you're an employee at Coca-Cola or one of these countless other companies that are singling you out based on your race and insulting you, harassing you based on your race, you need to file a lawsuit to, to sit there obediently and take it. If, if, if that's what you're going to do, then it's never going to end. File a lawsuit, make them defend it in court. And look, the courts are largely run by the left as well, so maybe the lawsuit isn't successful, but we at least have to force them to defend it. Force them to go into court in front of a judge and explain how this does not count as racial harassment. Now, the thing about this law, speaking of racial harassment, um, race-based harassment in the workplace is already illegal. So this law shouldn't be necessary. What this law is doing is making something illegal that's already illegal. But the law is necessary because, because the current law, the current federal law, and policies are not being equally enforced. And so now West Virginia is passing another law that, that's more specific, make very clear that this applies to all races. And it's not just that you're not allowed to racially harass certain races, but you can with others. We shouldn't need a law like this, but we do. And anyone who says that this is an infringement on, um, on you know, the, the, the rights of business owners or anything, Anyone who says that is, is, is silly. Um, what this is again doing is outlawing race-based harassment in the workplace. Now, if you want to take the uber libertarian position and say that race-based harassment in the workplace should be allowed for anybody, then go ahead and defend that position. It's not the position I would take, but go ahead and defend it, but, but make sure you defend it consistently. Um, Number three, NBC is getting some backlash over a scene from a show called Nurses, which I've never heard of this show before, but apparently it fills the need for another medical drama on network TV because we've only seen about 53,000 of those. So we needed another one. And, uh, and here's this one. This scene portrays a, a Hasidic Jew refusing a bone graft from a non-Jew, you know, because he's, he's, he's religious and therefore a bigot, according to... Uh, the people who come up with these shows. Let's let's watch this scene. The graft, where does it come from? It's called an aloe bone graft. It's harvested from a deceased donor. But you want to put a dead leg inside of me? A dead goyim leg. 
from anyone, an Arab, a woman. Or God forbid, an Arab woman. Look, you can't be lugging this metal cage around. No, I don't consent. Ezreal, without this next step, you will never walk properly again. Which means forget about basketball. Well, which is obviously what he wants. It's God who heals what he creates. A dead Goyam leg. Wouldn't want one of, the, wouldn't want one of those. Uh, there's, there's a lot of backlash to NBC for this. As I said, um, and there should be, because this is obviously um, making a caricature of religious Jews. And as, as, as far as I'm aware, I'm, I'm no expert on the specifics of Jewish law, but as far as I'm aware, this is completely made up. There is no Jewish law that would prohibit so, you know, someone from getting a bone graft um, from a non-Jew. So they've, they've, they've made up this, this rule of Judaism just so that they could slander religious people. Um, and that's outrageous. We should also note, though, that this is what network TV does to Christians every single day. This is, this is, this is uh, not just anti-Jewish bigotry or anti-Christian. It's anti-religious. That's what we're getting. I mean, they, they love to make the religious people the villains. If they need a stand-in, if they, if they need just a scene with some sort of ignorant person... Well, make them religious. And as Christians, we've been dealing with this for years where they, they, they'll, they'll make up rules of Christianity that don't exist or a whole new form of Christianity that doesn't exist uh, just so that they can have a character who adopts that made up form and then they can use that to slander Christians in general. So we've seen this over and over again. It is an anti-religious thing with one exception. So it's anti-religious. Um, the only exception would be, of course, Islam. So you're, you're never going to see a scene like that on network TV, especially on a, a network like NBC, where that person is a Muslim objecting to, you know, a bone graft from an infidel. Infidel. So they make the one exception, but all other religions they hate. Except for the religion, obviously, of, of, uh, of leftism, which is itself its own religion. Number four, I'm sorry I have to do this, but, but I think I do. Um, the TikTok singers are at it again, and I need to play these for you. A lot of people complain when I play this stuff. They say, you know, why are you subjecting us to this? Well, it's for your own good. For your own good. Now sit down, shut up, and listen to this. If I had to hear it, then so do you. We've got two now. We've got two TikTok singers. We'll play the first one. This is a teacher in her classroom. So at least she's, she's, she's at school, she's back in class. I don't know where this teacher is, but she's in the classroom. Good for her. Except the only problem is that she's in the classroom so that she can record TikTok singing videos. And here it is. Let's listen. If you don't believe that there is white privilege, please don't teach. If you don't believe that black lives matter, please don't teach. If you don't believe in systemic racism and how it negatively impacts our students of color and don't want to help dismantle those systems, please don't teach. Oh, dear Lord. The thing that always gets me with these videos is the expression. You can see the expression on her face. The expression they made that on their face at the end of it. They're so proud of themselves. And they feel like they've really accomplished something. I don't know what they think they've accomplished. What, what, are, you, what are you going for here? What result are you hoping for? Because all you're going to get is mockery and scorn from almost everybody. I assume you didn't want that. What did you think was going to happen? Did you think that the internet, you would put this out there uh, into cyberspace and the response from the internet would be, wow, wow, gee, that's a great song. Miss, can you sing another? That one was pretty bad. This one's even worse. Let's listen. If you're white, yes, you are racist. Even if you think you're woke, we all benefit from oppression. Pretending you're not racist only makes racism grow. Kind of like the first song better, I have to say. The first song was a little bit ca- catchier. She needs some work on that one. Wasn't a big fan there. I, it's, it's probably not worth dissecting, you know, the the argument such as it was, which she presented there. But um, she seems to be saying that, she says, if you're white, you're racist. And the reason why you're racist as a white person is because you, you benefit from oppression. Which... 
Now, I reject that premise. I don't think that every white person automatically benefits from oppression. And most of what she would consider oppression, I don't think is oppression at all. But, uh, but even if that were true, how does that make you racist? I mean, for the sake of argument, if you, even if I were to agree that white people benefit from oppression, why does that make them racist automatically? Well, she can't explain it. She doesn't need to explain it. That's why she's singing. Um, all right, we'll move on. Finally, the, the Daily Wire has some unfortunate news if you're planning to take a cruise anytime soon. It says, Crystal Cruises had, has announced a plan to require all passengers to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 at least 14 days before they take a voyage on their ships, and passengers will have to provide proof of the vaccination. The company said in a statement, the company has uh, voluntarily passed or paused operations th- through May 2021 for its river fleet into June for its ocean ships, ships and through August 1st for Crystal East Spirit, allowing most travelers sufficient time to get fully vaccinated before Crystal's resumption of sailing. The company said it hopes by the time it resumes operations, vaccines will be widely available to Americans. Um, and then there are, let's see, last November, a top travel industry association said it was in the final stages of developing a digital passport for international travelers so they can prove that they've been vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, and it looks like a number of other cruise companies have also adopted this. Um, uh, Crystal is the fourth company to announce it will require vaccines for its passengers. American Queen Steamboat Company and Victory Cruise Lines both did so earlier this month. So it seems so far, this is something we're mainly seeing from the cruise industry requiring vaccinations. Will it become a trend that catches on? Uh, I mean, the major airlines, well, I think a few airlines are right now, at least regional airlines. Will the major Delta, you know, will we start seeing that? I don't know. Um, if, if, if this has the effect of discouraging people from going on a cruise, then probably all for, for, for the best. Honestly, I don't know why you'd want to go on a cruise anyway. Especially now, after we, we, we saw what happened. I mean, we, we think back to last spring. There were these horror stories. COVID breaks out on the ship and everyone's quarantined on the ship in their little cabins for weeks. But even aside from that, I, I can tell you, as someone who's been, I went on one cruise one time. And um, I can tell you, it's, it's not the way to travel. It just isn't. The, the one advantage of the cruise, there's, there's only one good thing about a cruise. And that is the food. You just eat. All you do on the cruise is constantly eat. There's always some sort of buffet available. And you're constantly eating. And drinking too. And the way they get you on the cruise is that they give you, at least the cruise that I went on. I don't know if, I'm assuming this is probably the universal standard. But they give you a little card. They they don't charge for the drinks. The, The food is actually free. The drinks seem like they're free. They don't charge you for it at the time, but they give you this nice little nifty card. And uh, it's, not, it's not like a credit card. It's just a, it's just a little, nice little card. And every time you get a drink, they, you just hand them the card. They quickly sw- swipe it. No big deal. And you're drinking. You're having a good time. And then on the last day of the cruise, they stick that bill under the door for all the drinks you had. And then you look at that and say, did I really drink $800 worth of booze in three days? Apparently I did. So stay away from cruises. All right. Let's go to uh, reading the comments now. This is from, username is Ted Kaczynski. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking not the actual guy, but who knows. Uh, he says, teach statistical literacy, not critical race theory. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We, we talked yesterday about how Americans, according to a survey by Skeptic Mag- Magazine, Americans vastly uh, overestimate the number of unarmed black men that are killed by police every year. Uh, I mean, there, there's a preponderance of Americans that think that like a thousand or 10,000 unarmed black men are killed by police every year. And a lot of that goes to, like we talked about media propaganda. This is, this is the, the, the disinformation campaign from the media bearing its fruits. But yeah, it does, it does also speak to um, a more general problem that I've noticed among Americans, which is having no concept of how statistics work. No way to measure these things in, in, in your head. Because even if you have bought into media disinformation, I mean, 10,000 a year? This is something that they should be teaching in schools, is statistics, how do they work, giving people a good sense of them. But um, no, they're not, they're not focused on that. 
Sarah Wooten says, personally, Matt, in addition to the longer shows, I would also like for you to star in a movie as Gina as Gina's rollerblading crime fighting sidekick. Otherwise, you're canceled. Well, Sarah, you know, I don't like when people make demands. Normally, I would ban you from the show for that. But uh, I love the suggestion and I would do that in a heartbeat. Um, Ali Boo says, I would rather have one giraffe than 10,000 people. Well, if that's the case, then you're a sociopath. See, I always assume that the people who pretend to value animals over people are doing just that, pretending. But if you actually would value a giraffe over over a person, maybe I should start taking people more seriously when they make this claim. Because if that's really the case, then you're simply a sociopath. So I'm going to hope that it's not. Um, Luca says, Matt, what do you use as bait for fishing? Um, I, you know, I'm kind of, I'm more of a finesse fisher. So I, I, fisherman, so I use the uh, rubber worms and that kind of thing. It's, I, I, I tend to, to go more with that. I like those over the moving baits. The youth of the nation says, you know, you're young when Matt says Walkman and cassette and you think he's speaking Russian. Great show, Matt. Yeah, well, that's, that's the cutoff. So you, 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 you missed the days of, uh, not just Walkman and cassette, but that was back in the day. If you wanted to make a, a mixtape. You don't know anything about this because you're a youngster. But back in my day, you would have the recording cassette, empty cassette. You know, you put it in your boom box. And if you wanted to make a mixtape, you would sit by the radio and wait for them to play the, your favorite song and hit, hit play and record. And you'd make your, it could take, it could take all day. It could take 16 hours to get like the seven songs you want on your mixtape. That took effort. Your kids don't know anything about that these days. Um, Asian Egg says, should probably skip the next episode. I think it's going to be real bad. Episode 666. Yeah, a lot of comments about the fact that this show is episode 666. That's true. I'm not worried about that. I just want to say I'm not superstitious. It's just a number. So relax. Besides, I sprinkled the studio with holy water before the show. So I think we're good. It's more important now than it's ever been to support companies that have morals to support companies that support us in the culture companies that are they're that are working for us and with us um, as conservatives and pro-lifers and one company that fits that description to a t is charity mobile they're the pro-life phone company and they earn that uh that that label uh by for one thing five percent of your monthly plan price goes to pro, the pro-life pro-family charity of your choice and that's, you know, that's, that's the charity that comes with it so that you're, you're getting a great service and you know that you're doing uh, good work at the same time. You're helping the pro-life cause. You're also supporting a company that, uh, that helps the pro-life cause. And on top of that, there are a lot of great perks as well. You get new activations and eligible accounts. Uh, get a free cell phone with free activation and free shipping. There's no contract. There's no termination fees. And uh, what I always tell people when they ask about Charity Mobile is there's no risk with a 30-day guarantee. So you might as well give it a shot. Try it out. Um, and I think you're going you're gonna to love Charity Mobile. They also have live customer service based right here in the USA on top of that. Free usage alerts, free apps to monitor your usage, pay your bill, and much more. So there's the convenience that comes with it as well. But it all comes down to the fact that you're helping to build a culture of life in America while supporting a pro-life phone company. And you get that nationwide service on America's largest and most reliable 4G LTE network. I use Charity Mobile. That's that's the service I go with, and I couldn't be happier with it. No complaints at all. Call us at one eight seven seven four seven four three six six two or chat with them online at charitymobile.com. Uh, also, you know there are so many narratives around hot topic hot topic issues, and it's hard to keep track of all the newest controversies that the left decides to be offended by. It's always a new thing every day. So get ready for the Daily Wire's newest show, soon to be released. That's debunked where Ben Shapiro exposes leftist fallacies in 15 minutes or less. Climate change, universal health care, COVID policies, all these. He's using facts and logic going up against the media narrative. This show will be available exclusively to Daily Wire members. So if you aren't already a member, go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code debunked to get 25% off. You don't want to miss Ben, so use code debunked to get 25% off. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we're going to cancel Canada. Again, this makes Canada now the most canceled country, a well-deserved distinction. This time they're in for a cancellation because of something called Pink Shirt Day, which was evidently observed yesterday. Here is the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, explaining it. Today is Pink Shirt Day. It's a day when people come together by wearing pink to school, 
or work to show they're against bullying. Bullying hurts. If you're being bullied, know that you aren't alone. Reach out and talk to someone you trust. Everyone should feel safe, supported and accepted wherever they go. We all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. On Pink Shirt Day, wear pink and stand up against bullying and promote the importance of being kind. Reach out, reach out. It's like kind of like oat, reach an oat. Reach out, say you're sorry. Yes, we're going to end bullying by wearing a pink shirt. And if that doesn't work, we can try a blue shirt, maybe a red shirt. Red may be the ticket. Red means stop. So bullies will see the red shirt and they'll think, I should stop bullying. At which point they'll open up the locker and let the the nerd run free again. Who knows? You know, it could work that way. Probably not, but it could. You know, we haven't heard as much about bullying this past year with kids locked in their homes, staring at screens. The uh, traditional forms of bullying have temporarily receded into the background, though that's only increased opportunities for the cyber bullies to do their worst, unfortunately. But once all the schools are opened again, whenever that is, hopefully within the next decade, these anti-bullying campaigns will return to prominence. And the thing about anti-bullying campaigns is that they're always as painfully ridiculous and ineffectual as Pink Shirt Day in Canada. There has never been an anti-bullying campaign that's managed to rise above the pink shirt day tier. Why is that? I'm glad you asked. The problem with anti-bullying campaigns is that they focus on the wrong person. Now, I'm quite certain that what I'm about to say here will be wildly misconstrued and taken out of context, par for the course, but I'll say it anyway. The real problem with bullying today is the way the bullying is handled by the victim. Call this victim blaming if you want. That's not the label I would use. But either way, this is my point. There have always been bullies in the world, right? There always will be bullies in the world. We've all been guilty of bullying at some point, probably many points in our lives. We've also been the victims of bullying at some point, probably many points in our lives. The bully and victim camps are the same camp. It would be nice if we could keep the two apart, right? Very neatly. You got the bullies here, you got the victims here. Uh, Bad guys, good guys. But we can't because they're all together. They're all a jumbled mess. It's like trying to divide the world between those who tell lies and those who are lied to. It may be true that some people obviously are more honest than others, but does anyone want to claim that they've never told a lie? If you do make that claim, well, that's just another lie to add to your list. So bullying is something that we've all experienced on both ends. That's because we're human beings and we're flawed. And sometimes we can be mean to each other. That's especially the case when we're kids. What this means is that there's no reason to think that that, that bullying happens more now than it ever did or that it's worse now than it ever was. Bullying is born from our nature as human beings. And our nature as human beings hasn't changed in the last 10 years or 20 years or whatever. Yet it does seem like kids today are more affected by bullying than they've ever been. They're developing complexes and neuroses and insecurities, sometimes to a crippling extent. Some children, in the most extreme cases, end up killing themselves. Something that was that was simply unheard of back in the old days. I mean, you, you didn't hear about a 12-year-old child killing themselves because they were bullied. Certainly not as, not, as, not as common as it is today. The popular explanation for this change is that the bullying is worse, more common, more vicious, and so on. But I don't think that's there's much evidence for that. And as I said, an understanding of human nature leads one to doubt that bullies would be any meaner now than they've ever been. The issue, it would seem, is that kids today are more vulnerable to the bullying, less emotionally and psychologically equipped to confront it and handle it. Is it just a matter of kids being soft or weak? No, that would be a a gross oversimplification. The problem is that kids today, because they spend all day around their peers in public school, lockdowns notwithstanding, and, and, and they, they carry that peer culture around with them in their pockets on their phones, which means that even when they're not in school, still they can't escape it. Because of this, they've become desperately dependent on their peers for acceptance and approval. Kids have always wanted acceptance and approval from their friends, obviously. Everybody wants that. Everyone's always wanted that. The difference is that through the school system and modern technology, kids today cannot ever get away from each other. 
They are always around each other in some form, always immersed in each other's business, each other's lives. This not only has the effect of conditioning them to seek approval constantly, but it also raises the stakes. It means that the consequences of being shamed by your peers, rejected, humiliated, those consequences cannot ever, ever be escaped from the child's perspective. Mockery at school turns into mockery online. It's everywhere. You can't just go home and it goes away, at least for a few hours. It doesn't work that way. So when I say that the problem with bullying today is the way that the bullied kids are more vulnerable to it, that is not to blame the victim. It's not our children's fault that this is the world we've given to them. It's our fault. But we should understand that the bullying is not the problem in and of itself. The bullies we will always have with us. The problem is that we've, we've thrown our kids into an environment where they are at the bully's mercy all the time, everywhere, and they are conditioned more than any other generation of children in history to depend on the approval of their peers. Which means that when that approval is rescinded, the effect can be dire, even fatal. So, uh, what's the answer? The answer is for parents to, as much as possible, insulate their children from this suffocating, stifling, ubiquitous peer culture. Give them a life outside of that. Give them a chance to breathe. Orient them so that they, they look somewhere else for approval and affirmation. They look to you, hopefully. That's where they should be looking. You know, uh, parents who send their kids to public school, especially these days, and we, we, we've gotten so used to this, we, t we, we take it for granted. We think it's just this is the way it's supposed to be. But there is a, a, oftentimes a very sudden moment, like a moment in time that parents can tell you about. When, um, you know, their kid is just a normal kid and they, 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 they love mommy and daddy and, uh, and, and they want approval from their parents. And then something happens and it's like a severing. And they don't care about their parents anymore. They don't care what their parents think. They even like hate their parents for no apparent reason. Um, and it's all about their peers. You know, and this can happen, happens at different ages. It can happen at the age of, of nine years old. It happens at 12, 13. Now, parents talk about this like it's normal. Like it's, uh, it's the way it always is. It's just how kids are. It's not normal. It's normal now. It doesn't have to be. We've set up our culture so it works this way, but it shouldn't work this way. The reason why it happens is because the kids, again, are immersed in that peer culture so much that at a certain point, and it can happen very suddenly, they just stop caring about anything or anyone else. The goal then should be to get them to look to you as the parent. Now, this is hard to do. But that has to be our goal as parents. And that means maybe not giving your 12-year-old a smartphone. Um, carefully regulate his time online. Force him to have a life, a real life. Homeschooling could be a big help here. Give your child the sort of emotional and psychological conditioning that he needs, the sort of living condition that he needs in order to deal with the bullies when they come, which they will, because that's life, and it's not going to change. And that's why... Who's canceled again? Canada. That's why Canada is canceled. Um, and uh, we, we, took a, we took a long path around to get back around to Canada is canceled, which, which I mean, really, Canada would have been canceled regardless of any of this anyway. Um, it, was, it was just time for another, another one. I was looking for an excuse, and I found it. A little bit of an example right now of bullying. This is me bullying Canada at the moment, but they deserve it. So that's it. Canada's canceled. We'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Danny D'Amico. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Nika Geneva. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Walsh Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. A new Gallup poll shows a huge spike in LGBT identity. Mitt Romney makes a shocking prediction about 2024, and a Joe Biden HHS official supports puberty blockers for kids. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.